Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be his most sacred heart, blessed be his most precious blood, blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar, blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, the Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.
of dogmatic theology here at the seminary. Uh, normally, I would lead us in an opening prayer, but Father Jeff has a, has a specific opening uh, prayer that he would like to lead, so I'll, I'll punt that to him. Our presenter this evening is Father Jeffrey Muntz. Father Muntz is a native of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, as you'll hear from his, his Chalmette accent uh, in just a minute. He attended minor seminary at St. Joseph Seminary College on the North Shore, major seminary here at Notre Dame, 
and he earned his sacred theology licentiate in spiritual theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome in 2015. Since then, Father Muntz has been on faculty here at the seminary as a professor of spiritual theology, and he currently serves as the spiritual director of the house and department chair of spiritual theology. Father Muntz's presentation tonight will be on Eucharistic miracles and saints. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Muntz to the podium. So for our opening prayer, I'd like to draw from uh, the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. This is one of the hymns that he composed uh, for the Eucharist. Uh, the Pange Lingua is the, the title of it, but I'm going to uh, use this as a prayer. We'll pray it in English um, and just would ask us as we hear this, you know, it's probably one of those hymns. We sang it if you were here for adoration, so uh, it's very familiar to us. Uh, but truly a, a beautiful hymn for us to reflect upon in this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Acclaim my tongue this mystery of glorious body and precious blood, which the King of Nations shed for us, a noble womb, soul, fruitful bud, given and born from a virgin pure, having made this world his dwelling place, when the seeds of his words were sown afar, he ended his stay in wondrous grace. With brethren reclining at that last meal, he observes in full what the law demands, then gives himself as food instead to apostles twelve with his own hands. The word in flesh makes true bread flesh. The blood of Christ then comes from wine. Though senses fail to see this truth, Faith will make pure hearts incline. So great a sacrament, therefore, let us revere while kneeling down. Let old laws yield to this new right. Let faith, not sense, conviction ground. Praise and jubilation to the Father. Honor, virtue, blessing to the Son. And to the one who proceeds from both, in equal measure, may praise be sung. Amen. So before I uh, begin, I wanted to thank uh, someone who's here, uh, Mr. Philip Bellini, who is all the way in the back. Uh, he is uh, the DRE over at Good Shepherd Parish. I've actually known uh, Mr. Philip Bellini for quite a while. I met him my very first year in seminary formation uh, and my apostolic work uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Philip, uh, what was called the Dead Theologian Society. So it was a, a youth group he had put together and um, so I've been knowing him since the very beginning of my journey, and he's been with me throughout. Uh, and I want to thank him because uh, he has kindly uh, given of himself this evening. Uh, what we have in the back there, and you can look at this after the presentation, or if my presentation is particularly boring, feel free to start looking uh, in the middle of it. Uh, but that is some examples of Eucharistic miracles that have occurred. Uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, they give a description, the location, uh, and as you'll see, there are many, and this is only a small portion, actually, of the entire uh, presentation uh, that Mr. Philip has a copy of, but just would invite you to, to look at that afterwards. And again, uh, just a word of, of thanks to Mr. Philip for bringing that. Um, now, I wanted to begin by offering a bit of a clarification. While the topic of this presentation tonight is Eucharistic miracles, I truly want us to recognize that every single celebration of Holy Mass is a Eucharistic miracle, right? Every single celebration of the Holy Mass is a Eucharistic miracle. What I mean by that is that every time we celebrate Mass, every time that priest consecrates bread and wine, it is transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Right? That is, in and of itself, a miracle. Right? We could even say it's the miracle of all miracles. Really. It's the greatest miracle that God gives us, and this happens at every single Mass. However, at the level of what we theologically call the accidents 
right? So this is what we see with our senses, right? What we uh, hear, what we taste, even with our tongue as regards to the Eucharist. At that level of our senses, nothing appears to change from one moment to the next in the Mass, before the consecration and after. It looks the same, it tastes the same, it smells the same. Uh, the host still looks like bread, it still tastes like bread. The miracle that takes place then at every single Mass is something that can only be known by faith. Uh, that opening prayer uh, that I led us in uh, is one of the great hymns of St. Thomas Aquinas, one of his great Eucharistic hymns, the Pange Lingua. Uh, and th those words there, those senses fail to see this truth, faith will make pure hearts inclined. Let faith, not sense, conviction bring. Right? This mystery, what we'll be talking about tonight, right, truly can only be known by faith, can only be believed by faith. Uh, sight uh, cannot reveal this, this mystery. Uh, it's also important to say that faith is not and count, cannot be grounded exclusively in Eucharistic miracles. Uh, anyone, for example, can jump on a plane, fly to Lanciano, Italy, which you can see the, the display for Lanciano back there, and you can go and look at the monstrance contained there that has the host that was transformed into blood and into right, flesh. You can go and look at that with your eyes, but only someone who has his or her heart open to God's grace can truly come to a place of faith in the Eucharist. As St. Thomas Aquinas expressed it, believing is an act of the intellect which under the influence of the will, moved by God through grace, gives consent to its divine truth. Right? Only we can give that consent to this divine truth. God will never force that consent out of us, nor will God ever manipulate a consent out of us. Although every single mass could truly be called a Eucharistic miracle, typically when we use this phrase Eucharistic miracle, what we're referring to is those instances when to our human senses, the change that is ordinarily invisible to us becomes visible in some profound way, oftentimes in a very dramatic way. But that observable change is still limited to what human senses reveal. What do I mean by this? The scientific study of a Eucharistic miracle can tell us, for example, that only a moment ago, what was a piece of unleavened bread is now living human heart tissue. Right? That's what science can tell us. Science can tell us what was only a moment ago four ounces of wine is now four ounces of human blood. Science could also tell us that this human heart tissue, right, this is in the case of the miracle in Lanciano, which dates back to the eighth century, uh, and which isn't preserved in any way, should have decomposed. It shouldn't be here any longer, and yet somehow it still is. However, science will never be able to prove to us that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It's beyond the scope of science to be able to prove that. There have been hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people, who since the eighth century have seen that Eucharistic miracle of Lanciano with their own eyes. And yet, some of those people maybe didn't have their faith in the Eucharist deepened. Or maybe for some of them, you know, at the moment that they first behold the miracle, they find their faith stirred up and they come away with a, a passion, a greater love for the Eucharist. But then as time goes on, as the weight of the world weighs on them, they start to lose that faith. That fire starts to fade away. I'm reminded of a, a young man that I once encountered um, and uh, he started sharing with me that he was skeptical towards a lot of the things taught by the church. And so I thought, well, maybe to help him come to a deeper faith, I'm going to tell him about the Eucharistic miracles. And so I started sharing some of the stories with him, especially about 
the Eucharistic miracle in Lanciano. Um, and, you know, he seemed totally unimpressed as I was sharing this to him. And he said, he just kept insisting, there has to be a scientific explanation. There has to be a scientific explanation. He said, well, maybe the people really wanted that bread to turn into flesh and blood. And so they wanted it so bad that that's what it became in this particular instance. You know, I'm sure eventually science is going to be able to figure out how this happens. Uh, so I asked him, like, look, really, in, in all seriousness, are you familiar with other instances of life where something transforms into this complete other thing? Right? Does this regularly happen in your life? Have you ever sat down to eat supper and you look down at what you had and you said, oh man, I really wish this was a nice steak. I really could eat a steak right now and magically, right, that meal became a steak. Right? No, it doesn't happen. Uh, have you ever witnessed, for that matter, the phenomena of something just transforming into something else before your eyes? Um, and furthermore, as Catholics, we believe that that bread and wine is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Notice that in none of the Eucharistic miracles did the host suddenly become a rabbit, right? In none of these miracles did, you know, it suddenly turn into a, a piece of metal or a rock or anything else for that matter. In fact, it is only ever turned into what we say it is, flesh and blood. And even if we could contribute attribute this change to the faith of the believers if, as if somehow they believe so hard it just, you know, magically changes, right, in these different contexts. In what other aspects of our lives do we witness this happening, right? Uh, does anyone ever say, boy, you know, I could really use a million dollars, and they pull a one dollar bill out of their pocket, and they just I could really, I really need a million dollars, and it becomes a million dollars, right? It doesn't happen. We know these kinds of transformations are not a part of our life. But no matter what examples I use, no matter what I said, this young man had a block. He didn't accept anything that I said uh, because he was not open to faith in the Eucharist. He was unwilling to give consent, right, to, to allow his will to be opened and to move, to consent to that. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, people have become uncomfortable, I would say, with the very notion of miracles as a whole. Uh, in some circles, miracles are seen to be sort of like, that's the crutch of weak people, uh, weak-minded people who are just unwilling to accept the reality that there is no God, there is nothing supernatural, all that exists is what we can see and observe with our eyes, right, and what science can observe, and so beyond that, there is nothing. Uh, and people will hold this position, even in the case of that young man that I relayed in that story, really to a point of absurdity, I think. Uh, and so again, we return to this place of faith. Faith is necessary when it comes to the Eucharist. Even a Eucharistic miracle requires a degree of belief. Still, I think these instances of Eucharistic miracles uh, can really be considered an expression of God's mercy to us. God knows the human condition. He knows that we have been affected by original sin uh, and that we face in our lives many obstacles to faith. Uh, and so these miracles, I think, are an expression of God's mercy because they're an aid to us in that faith. In his mercy, he's giving us something to kind of hold on to, to help us out, because we can't see it with our eyes. Well, as Catholic Christians, we aren't obliged to believe in Eucharistic miracles. We do, of course, have to believe in the Eucharist. Um, that is, that bread and wine, which is consecrated at Mass, is transformed by the grace of God into the body, blood, soul and divinity of Jesus, at the same time, we shouldn't exclude the possibility that God can intervene in an extraordinary way through a Eucharistic miracle. Of course, the church approaches these miracles uh, with an appropriate prudence 
an appropriate caution. Otherwise, Christians could very easily be led into, you know, taking up with any suggestion, any kind of illusion that someone throws their way. And I've seen different sorts of excessive belief uh, in my time in parish ministry. Some people seem to be kind of chasing every rumor of the miraculous, right? They seem to chase every supernatural occurrence. And it can get to a point where every celebration of the Mass, that person is expecting to have some kind of fireworks happen. God is supposed to make my heart just explode with love, or I'm supposed to see blood coming out of that host and flowing into my heart. I'm supposed to have some kind of miraculous experience, some supernatural vision at every Mass. Now, brothers and sisters, let me be clear, that is not the norm. Right? Miraculous occurrences are not the norm. That's why we call them miracles, right? extraordinary. It's one of the words we use to describe this. Well, the church, in her wisdom, wants to be very cautious that the celebration of the Mass is not treated as something that is secondary to flashier, more dramatic miracles. Uh, such a misconception misses the mark because every single celebration of the Mass is the miracle of all miracles. Whether or not something extraordinary is seen, whether or not something extraordinary is felt, every single Mass is the miracle of all miracles. In truth, God is feeding us with his precious body, blood, soul, and divinity. And that is whether we experience emotional fireworks when we receive the Eucharist or whether we don't. What matters most is the reality of faith. In every single Mass, God is giving himself completely to us. Right? He gives us his entire heart, his whole self. And so the reality of faith is what matters most. At the same time, I don't think there's any need in a prideful way to say, well, I don't need those Eucharistic miracles. I have strong enough faith. I already believe in the Eucharist. I don't, I don't need miracles. Right? While our faith can't be based on Eucharistic miracles alone, they sure can go a long way to helping us. Right? And God, obviously, in his wisdom and his providence, knows that they can help us. He's given them to the church for a reason. They help us to see that something extraordinary is happening at each and every Mass, something that science can't explain, something that my senses can't register. And they call us to live every aspect of our lives in accord with our faith. Now, my presumption is that everybody who's here tonight probably already firmly believes in the Eucharist. But I think the information that is being made available at the same time is a gift from God. All of us can grow in faith, and so it can help to strengthen our faith, to deepen our faith. This is a, a, particular, a particularly important, uh, I think, point since we refer to the Eucharist as the source and the summit of our faith, right? So it begins, right, and it leads to uh, the highest point in that sense. The Second Vatican Council tells us that the Eucharist contains the church's entire spiritual wealth because it contains Christ himself. Uh, the Eucharistic celebration is the, quote, sacramental representation of the Paschal mystery. That is, right, the passion, death, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. All of that is contained in the Eucharist. In other words, that sacrifice that Jesus offered once and for all when he laid down his life for us in Calvary is being represented sacramentally made present at each and every Mass. And every time that we have that privilege of receiving the Eucharist, Jesus himself abides within us. Right? That's why we call this Holy Communion. It is the most profound moment of union that we can experience on this earth with our God. We experience a true union with God in those moments of Holy Communion. St. Therese of Avila, who throughout the course of her life had several, right, many profound mystical experiences, um, uh, 
experiences right these forms of ecstasy where she's being lifted off i always love uh, that sculpture of bernini of saint Teresa in ecstasy right where she's experiencing her heart being pierced right by the love of god and you can see that look of ecstasy on her face this ecstatic love she's experiencing and yet despite the fact that she had had these profound mystical experiences she insists that there is no greater experience of the love of god than what we find in the holy eucharist right the most profound vision the most profound locution that any of the saints have ever experienced nothing nothing can overcome the power of the eucharist that is the most profound gift that we can receive in our spiritual lives even the most intense felt experience in our personal prayer is only a glimmer of the grace that is given to us in the holy eucharist now if you're anything like me um, you don't experience holy communion as a mystical revelation every time that you receive the eucharist in other words i don't experience visions i don't experience locutions i don't see the heavens open up and see angels right flying around every time that i receive the eucharist and this is in part then why god sees fit to give us aids to our faith right uh, it's really as i said an expression of his mercy god is trying to help us to come to a deeper understanding a deeper love of the eucharist through these miracles god is helping us to believe that what we receive is not merely a piece of bread it's not merely a drop of wine but it truly is the body blood soul and divinity of jesus christ i think that one of the jobs of the new evangelization is perhaps to visit and to revisit if need be for the first time the aids that god has given us to our faith right those helps that he has given to us and the eucharistic miracles are a clear example of a help that god has given to us and he's given us these helps for a reason. When he wrote his encyclical letter on the Eucharist, Pope St. John Paul II said, I would like to rekindle a Eucharistic amazement in the living sacrament of his body and his blood. The church draws her life from Christ in the Eucharist. By him she is fed, and by him she is enlightened. My hope is that something that I say tonight, or something that you read tonight, will help you to experience that, to, to have something rekindled within your heart. So perhaps the next time that you go to Mass, the next time that you receive the Eucharist, that you will have a deeper faith, that you will be able to carry yourself with a deeper reverence. And maybe if you're somewhere, you know, struggling with your faith in the Eucharist, that maybe for the first time, you'll be able to discover that genuine amazement in the Eucharist we here in the Archdiocese of New Orleans, I think, seem to have a particularly strong devotion to the Eucharist uh, in terms of, for example, how many adoration chapels we have as compared to a lot of different dioceses. And so we have that particularly strong Eucharistic devotion. So we may be ignorant of other places where there actually seems to be sort of an anti-Eucharistic teaching, right? And this uh, was prevalent in some circles beginning in the 1970s uh, and it threatened not that that was the only time this has ever happened right but there's one particular moment where there were cer certain anti-eucharistic teachings going on uh, bob and penny lord uh, share in their book on eucharistic miracles um, that they once had a priest say to them quote until we get rid of the hocus pocus in our faith we'll never be able to get the people back the idea that Christ physically comes down to us in bread and wine is ridiculous. Right, so this is a priest who's celebrating Mass who's telling that, right? This whole thing is ridiculous. Uh, in an attempt to build community, sometimes there was a devaluation of the Eucharist. The ideas were focusing too much on that Eucharist that we're not focusing enough on one another. We need to build a greater sense of community. Um, and so, you know, what was said sometimes is that's not the body of Christ pointing at the Eucharist. 
we are the body of Christ, right? And drawing this strong uh, contrast, right, a theological uh, error there. And perhaps more than ever, when we look at these Eucharistic miracles, right, we can also think of how many people are struggling in their faith uh, because of the different scandals that have gone on in the church, right? There are a lot of people who might look at a priest now and say, wait, you're telling me God is going to work through that guy, right? When we know all of these horrible things that priests have done, you're telling me that God's working a miracle through his hands? Give me a break, right? So that, that is the reality, perhaps, of where many people might find themselves in faith. And so there's a, a dramatic sense, I think, in which we need to revisit these Eucharistic miracles to help to build back up what maybe has been eroded away. Now, let's be clear. There have been doubts about the Eucharist from the very beginning. Uh, I always appreciated that uh, Venerable Fulton J. Sheen uh, would argue that the cracks in Judas's priesthood begin at the point when Jesus reveals the Eucharist. He always points to the bread of life discourse, because that is the first time in Scripture when it's actually mentioned that Judas began to turn away from Christ. Right? The actual line is, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was to betray him. So the very first mention of Judas's betrayal comes right following that bread of life discourse. If one of Jesus's closest friends, somebody who walked with him, someone who talked with him, could doubt the Eucharist, then none of us is immune from doubts. Right? We need divine assistance to help us so that we don't get trapped in that same snare that Judas was trapped in, but instead so that we can have that grace of perseverance. So let's look at these helps, these miracles that God has provided us with throughout the centuries. So there have been over 120 Eucharistic miracles, right? I want to I want to repeat that number, right? Because I think that th that's pretty ridiculous, right? There have been over 120 Eucharistic miracles. That is an amazing truth. And lest the skeptics say, well, yeah, I bet they all happened in the Middle Ages, right? When there was no scientist around to be able to, right, observe any of this. It's just all those people, you know, who we were easily caught up in the hocus pocus, right? But this was all, you know, olden days. No, like, in fact, there have been, since 1992, there have been uh, five other Eucharistic miracles that have been approved by the church, and these miracles have occurred in four different countries. Uh, and as we'll see in the instance of the miracles of Lanciano and Buenos Aires, some of the miracles that left behind some specimen were able to be collected and then were able to be studied scientifically. Now, again, science is never going to be able to look at that specimen and say, aha, the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, right? That is beyond the scope of science. Uh, but what science can at least admit is this is beyond our natural explanations. We can't explain what, what happened here. Now, while there are commonalities between the different Eucharistic miracles that you can read about back there, so there's different commonalities, each one is different in its particular manifestation. Uh, the earliest uh, instance we have of a Eucharistic miracle that's recorded goes all the way back to the third century and is associated with St. Cyprian of Carthage. Uh, the most recent one we have comes from the 21st century. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of the presentation is to speak briefly about two particular Eucharistic miracles. Um, the first is probably the most well-known. That is the one, as I said, in Lanciano. Uh, the second century, and this was in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and this was actually while uh, Cardinal Bergoglio, who was now Pope Francis, was actually Cardinal right, of Buenos Aires. He was the Cardinal there. So about six years ago, I had the opportunity 
uh, to take a trip. This is while I was finishing up my studies in Rome, and I got to go to a number of places throughout Italy, and one of the places that I got to go to was Lanciano, Italy, to see the Eucharistic miracle there. Uh, and the first emotion that I would say I experienced as I was standing before that Eucharistic miracle was surprise. Not surprise at the miracle, but I was surprised that I was there with only two other people in the whole church. I was like, where is everybody at? Like, if this was down the street from my house, I'd be there every day, you know? But there was virtually no one in the church. One of the greatest Eucharistic miracles that we have that you can walk right up to and see, and there was hardly anyone there. And I kept thinking of uh, that you know, image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. If you've ever had the, the opportunity uh, to see that image, it's sealed off in this bomb-proof glass, you know, and it's way up high. Like you're not, There's no way you're going to touch it. And yet in Lanciano, and maybe this is the Italians, they, they don't seem too big on rules and things of this nature over there. So you, you just walk right up to it. Right? If you want to touch, you know, you're right there, buy it. So that was the, the first sort of startling thought I had. Um, but just shock, like there's only a handful of people here. Uh, well, the story goes that one day, this was in the 8th century, there was a Basilian monk who was celebrating Mass. And he consecrates the host, and he consecrates the wine, and he finds himself doubting. I don't think this is really, there's no way. This can't be the body and blood of Christ. So he's wrestling with a doubt in his heart. And moments later, the host turns into flesh. The wine turns into blood. Now, at first, uh, the monk who's celebrating, he's like dumbfounded. He didn't know what to do. But supposedly he actually tried, he was just like, I'm sure he was nervous, and he's like thinking, well, maybe I can hide this. He didn't know what in the world to do, and eventually he calms down, and he relays to the people what happened, and he says, I was doubting that this is really the body and blood of Christ, and it's actual flesh and blood now, and so it leads to people, you know, run up there. They're, they're looking at this, and then they have this, this great, they start running throughout the city and telling people, come and see, come and see, right? Um, well, today, these relics remain practically intact as they were, you know, and this is 13 centuries later, right? The host of flesh uh, has retained its original dimensions, essentially, um, and then the blood remains contained. It's in these uh, five, like, globulates. I don't know exactly what to, to call it. Um, and it's believed that the host actually remains in the original lunette. The lunette is sort of the, the, the little glass case that will contain the host, so that this host is in its original lunette uh, all the way from the 8th century, and the blood is contained in the same chalice that it was originally in. Uh, over the centuries, all that was changed about it was some of the decorations around this uh, were embellished, um, with that latest embellishment coming sometime in the early, uh, early 20th century. Now, when they were studied by science, uh, in the case of both of these relics uh, in the 1970s, both of them were discovered to be of human origin. Uh, the host was determined to be muscular tissue of the heart, and the blood was determined to be type AB. Uh, I think something also ought to be said about uh, the location in which this miracle took place. So Lanciano, Italy, where it happened, uh, has long been dedicated to St. Longinus. Now, if you know anything about St. Longinus, he is the one who, in tradition, pierced the heart of Jesus with a lance, right? And then, in the tradition, blood and water flow forth from Christ's heart, and through that experience of the blood and water flowing through Christ's heart, he is converted in that moment. Um, and he was later uh, martyred for his faith. Uh, and so the church in which this miracle took place in the 8th century was a church dedicated to St. Longinus, that saint right, who had been the one who had pierced the heart of Christ and who had that blood and water come forth. So I just find that very providential Right, that God would choose 
a church dedicated to that saint associated with that action right, in order to bring this mystery to us. Now, looking at the other miracle in 1996 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, a parishioner who received a consecrated host in his hand, he then dropped that host on the floor and walked off. Right? This is one of my, uh, uh, just, it, this is one of those things that I think breaks priest's heart when they see someone, you know, it's not just the action of, right, we can all make mistakes and drop something, but it shows the complete lack of faith if you can drop a host on the ground and just, you know, just walk right by it. And, and even sometimes the body language of how people receive Holy Communion, right? <laughs> you know, right? There's no faith there, right? So this person drops the host and walks off. Well, thankfully, another parishioner who'd been watching sees this host on the ground, picks the host up and brings it to the parish priest. So the parish priest places this host in what we call an ablution cup. Sometimes you may notice that a priest, after he's finished distributing communion, there's some kind of a little receptacle next to the tabernacle. Sometimes they're glass, sometimes they might be metal, right? And within that container is water. And what the priest does is after he's been distributing communion, he purifies his fingers in that ablution cup. So if you've ever wondered what that is or what it's called, it's called an ablution cup. So what this minister did, uh, or rather what this priest did, is he took that host and he placed it in the ablution cup and then placed the ablution cup in the tabernacle, thinking that the host would eventually dissolve. This is what happens sometimes where we maybe find a piece of a host or something of that nature. You can leave it in water to dissolve and then pour it into what we call the sequarium in the church. Well, what happens is the pastor noticed that the host was not dissolving. And in fact, not only was it not dissolving, but it had reddish stains on it. Uh, so the pastor then brings this to the attention of his bishop, who was Cardinal Bergoglio, right, Pope Francis. Uh, and so in October of 1996, there was an investigation to see what is this. So the initial specialist who was charged with the investigation found fragments of human DNA in the sample. Uh, he said it is human blood, it contains a genetic code, uh, and they discovered both human skin and white blood cells. Uh, over the next several years, there were numerous tests that were conducted uh, which were able to determine that the sample corresponded to the tissue of the human heart uh, and that there was evidence that whoever was the owner of this heart had suffered a great deal. Then a more in-depth in study was conducted in 2004 by Dr. Frederick Zugibe of Columbia University in New York. Uh, at the time, he was the leading expert in cardiac pathology and forensic medicine. And what was brought to him was brought to him as a blind sample. So he did not know this was a host that it transformed. He had no idea what this was being brought to him. So they bring it to him and they ask him, tell us what this is. So his conclusion after extensive testing was that the sample came from a heart muscle, a myocardium more precisely, the left ventricle of the heart. Uh, he also confirmed that the patient from whom this heart had come had suffered greatly, especially through the constraining of his breathing. More puzzling to him at the time that he studied, uh, in his own words, he said the heart was alive, right? That this sample that he's studying was still alive. And then when he inquired, where did you get this? The person says it was a consecrated host from a Catholic mass. And he said he was completely dumbfounded. He just could not believe it. Some of us, may struggle to believe, right? Um, like that teenager, we may be at that place where we say, you know, well, I, you know, I just can't believe, there's gotta be an explanation. Science has to be able to come up with an explanation for all of this. And so all I would ask of you, if you find yourself in that place of struggling in faith, just try to open your heart. Um, maybe perhaps even offer a prayer to the Lord Lord, help me to come to a deeper faith. Help me to come to a deeper belief in the Eucharist. Uh, as we reflect upon what I've shared, 
uh, and maybe take a look at some of these, as I said, these different presentations here, perhaps we can leave today with a greater love, a greater reverence for what is the sacrament of all sacraments, the most holy Eucharist. So thank you.
it, it's a very it's a it's a difficult theological question uh, to be able to answer. But the idea would be that the, the actual miracle is that the bread is transformed into heart tissue. But it's seemingly impersonal in a sense, and yet right, the Lord is obviously giving us that gift to aid us in our faith.
Well, they're not equivalent in the sense that one is presented to us as a sacrament, whereas the other is being presented to us as physical, physical nature. This is that I, I've tried, I was trying, I was, like I said, I was talking to Dr. Lebergo, trying to wrestle this out in my own mind, because I anticipated that that question would come up, uh, and I have not found a, a truly satisfactory answer to it myself. Because that, that's my whole mystery question, right? If, if, if this happens 300 times, how do we have 300 parts, right? I'm a little surprised to hear that there's a, a discussion about this because we've had other states that had instances of my location through the years in Ponte Pio. Sure. It was two locations physically and two sure. locations at the same time. So for Jesus to have bilocated his heart, this doesn't seem to me to be to just reproduce his heart. Yes. And I suppose, no, and I'm, I'm not going to disagree and say that's an impossibility. Right? So we have, we have to believe in his his resurrected body. Right? Yes. He has a resurrected body which is distinct from, right, his but human body located, prior to the resurrection. But could be bilocated to say other things of experience bilocation as well. Sure. It's a simple thing for God. Yeah. No, I imagine it is simple. It's hard for us to explain it theologically, is what I'm trying to say. Particularly because we also say that the Eucharist comes to us in a sacramental mode. Just to dovetail on that, it's, it seems like if human beings are going to analyze, you know, the tissue that really, it's, it is a mystery, like you're saying, and so it's not like we're going to crack the code and find Jesus' DNA and know what his strand is. So I see, I see what you're saying is, is how we're trying to define it as human beings to dissect it and understand Jesus' DNA. Well, we're never going to be, be able to do that. So I, I understand the I – you, you made it clear. Well, and, and some people have even proposed things like, for example, let's take a sample from this Eucharistic from this miracle, and let's cross-examine it with some blood that we can get from the Shroud of Turin, and we're going to be able to try and compile Jesus' DNA in that way. Um, and so far as I know, there have not been any successful attempts right, at, at doing that. I do one more question, and then we'll wrap up. I have to look. Mr. Fellow, do you know what is the closest one geographically to New Orleans?